Finnish education seems to be the best school system in the world, doesn't it? It was ranked number one in 2016 by the World Economic Forum and all the major news outlets promote Finnish education and we're taught that it's free, that it's liberal and it really promotes learning rather than just creating docile sheep as it's done in America. Because if you didn't know, the American school system is derived from the former police state Prussia and just look up the public mission statement of the American education system by the General Education Board in 1916, and you'll be pretty surprised. I have a good amount of videos on this channel. If you scroll down, you'll see videos I've done about the history of the modern school system. But Finland does things a little bit differently. So the question is, is it better? Is it a model that we should roll with? Why or why not? So I have a lot of opinions, but I want to keep this factual and then kind of go into opinions at the end. So I have a blog post on this. I'm not going to read all of it because you can totally read that on your own time and I don't want to bore you, but I am going to talk about kind of some of the pros that I listed on here. So one thing that's really great about the Finnish schools is that their compulsory schooling age starts a little bit later. So kids don't go to school until they're seven years old and then they enter only a nine year compulsory school system. They have shorter school days. So only from like 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. They have less classes in a day. So in America, we'll have seven different periods. Whereas in Finland, they might have two or three classes, but those classes go for a longer period of time. And I think this is beneficial because you get more time to focus. The, the sound of bells subconsciously teaches students that nothing is too important to focus on because you could be in the middle of your math class working on math and the bell rings and it's like, oh, I'm gonna put all of it away until tomorrow and go on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So you're constantly working, but you never actually finish anything meaningful. And then Finnish students also have the least amount of homework than any other student in the world, which is also good because who wants to do more school outside of school? Yeah. So what's interesting in Finland, the educational curriculum is created by the government and the government passes it down to the teachers and the teachers actually have a large degree of autonomy or like self-governance. So basically the central government says, we have key things that we want you to teach students. And it's very short, very simple. And the government kind of says, teachers teach them however you feel best. We're not gonna tell you how to teach, but we just have standards we want you to meet. And I, I can understand that. I don't really like that it comes from the central government, but at, hey, at least the teachers can self-govern and they can use their creative abilities to facilitate the information as they please. So this leaves teachers feeling encouraged. They get to express their creativity and the students also have a lot of individual learning and build close relationships with the teachers, which is also great. Teaching in Finland is also a pretty um, highly esteemed profession. So a Finnish teacher has to get a lot of requirements. They have to apply and lots of people apply to be a teacher, but not everybody gets in. You also have to go through a hands-on teacher training program and receive a master's degree too. So teachers spend fewer hours in the classroom, so they have more time to socialize. In Finnish schools, there's teacher socialized rooms uh, all around the school where they could come together, lesson plan together, or just relax and talk. And kids also have a lot of playtime. They get 15 minute breaks after every lesson, which I think is also great. I also like, okay, there's no mandatory standardized tests in Finland until the student's senior year in high school and that test does determine their future in a sense. But at least there's no competition, ranking, or really not much testing at all in the years leading up. And, and what this does is this promotes an environment where students like to learn and they enjoy learning because they're not really forced to and they have a lot of creativity to learn how they choose to focus on things that they're interested in and not be trained in competition with other people. And then the government also spends less on education than any other country, despite having even smaller classes. Um, and this point isn't that big of a deal. I don't really think we need to spend much education or much money on education at all. And I think the government should stay out of education in general. But these are a couple of the pros of Finnish schooling. And I think that um, I want to give credit to it because it's not horrible. It's way better than it is in America, but it's not optimal. And, and here's why. If you take children away from their parents and you raise them by the state, then the students and the children, I mean, will lose respect for their parents as an authority because now the state is raising up the students. Even if they're creating an environment of inclusivity 
and productivity and they're creating innovative thinkers and free thinkers, the kids are still away from their family. And this is a big issue because now these are the children of the state, not of the family. Having students raised in an authority, a government institution outside of the family will always lead to the destruction of the family. And we forget that humans are not machines. We were never meant to be machines and we're never going to be fulfilled if we live a life like a machine. Part of what it means to be human is to be connected to your environment, to be connected and self-aware to who you are, why you're here, what your purpose is, your purpose as an animal because we're animals, but also your purpose as uh, something spiritual too because we also are different than other animals in ways that we can imagine and we can use creativity and we can express ourselves in other ways. So there's actually two purposes that meet in harmony, which are important to have developed. Also, having a family is very important. That goes back to animal instinct and human instinct because it's how you feel connected. So two individuals come together who are in synchrony, they build a strong family, and now that strong family, family, that strong family is a united front. And now that strong family forms with other like-minded strong families, and now they can have a successful community, just like they did in the pre-colonial days. You can look at a lot of the New England colonies were self-governed for 200 to 300 years. They learned to get along with each other. They led very productive, independent, self-sufficient livelihoods. They had big, strong families, and there was no centralized authority, no centralized school system. The people were free. So it's possible. So let's look at some evidence that the Finnish education system is destroying the family just as much as the American education system is destroying the family. And it should be noted that Edward Ross from Columbia University in 1901, he wrote a book called Social Control, and he was a eugenicist, he was an educator. And in that book, he wrote that plans are underway to replace family, church, and community with education, mass media, and propaganda. Finland and America are doing a really great job at that. So, so let's go ahead and look at just some, some evidence. Okay, so statistics Finland. Number of families continue to decline. So actually, I wanna show you something else here. Let's look at, so the fertility rate, which is the total number of children born to a woman. Let's look at it in 1820. Okay, 1820, the fertility rate was 4.55. So Pretty much average woman had about you know four and a half children so some five children some four maybe some seven some three but the average was 4.55 so if we look at 1920 that number is 3.76 so it's gone down okay but now let's look at 2020 1.37 you went from 4.55 kids to 1.37 and see how the number, the fertility rate is slowly declining. It's been, I mean, it's been declining since the 1800s, but now we're in the negatives. And this is because women are not now go to school, they enter the workforce along with men, and this is destructive to the family. You can't have a productive family if, if both mom and dad are now partners working together, because at that point, you don't have husband and wife anymore, you have a partnership. And it's very different. And that's what this uh, bigger movement is all about with these socialist countries and a socialist school system, which we'll talk about later. But okay, so here's another one. Average number of people per family in Finland from 1960 to 2019. Okay, so, and we see the fertility rate, of course this goes a lot back, but even starting at 1960, it's gone down steadily every year. Now looking at some statistics deeper, now this is pretty shocking. So the number of childless couples grew. So, the number of co-building couples and children decreased by 600 families. The number of families formed by childless cohabiting couples increased by 2,530, so childless. Wow. Okay, so childless couples are growing. Okay, so there are in all 4,300 fewer families with children over the past, I think, couple of years in Finland. So the total number of families with children was 562,000 that number has declined by 4,300 from the year before. 
This decrease is bigger than last year and clearly bigger on average in a good decade when the annual increase has been about 2000. So every year, just about the number of families with children are decreasing by 2000. But I believe this study measured in 2019, uh, they declined double that, more than double at 4,300. Number of reconstituted families decreasing. Okay, so we see that happening. Um, it's I don't even know what to say about it. I have more here that was linked on the blog too. So now this is more about marriages. Okay, so marriages are also declining and I'm getting my data from Wikipedia. So let's look. Okay, I find it interesting. Attitudes towards marriage have changed substantially since World War II. Most obvious was the declining marriage rate, which dropped from 8.5 marriages per 1,000 Finns in 1950 to 5.8 in 1984. And it's declined more since then, of course. In 1950, there were 34,000 marriages. In 1984, only 28,500 were registered, despite a growth of population of 800,000. So the population's growing, but marriages still aren't happening. The practice of cohabilitation became increasingly common. So when a man and a woman live together but aren't married, so much so by the late 1970s, most marriages in urban areas grew out of what Finns called open unions. So in the 1980s, it was estimated that about 8% of couples who lived together, so about 200,000 people, did so without the benefit of marriage. A result of the frequency of cohabilitation was that marriages were postponed and the average age for marriage, which had been falling, began to rise by 1970s. Wow, so by 1982, the average age was 24.8 for women and 26.8 for men, several higher for both sexes. While the number of marriages was declining, divorce became more common, increasing 250% between 1950 and 1980. 3,500 divorces in 1952, 5,000 divorces in 1960. Now we're up to 9,500 a year during the first half of the 1980s. And of course it's gone up since, since then. I wanna come back to that, but I also wanna talk about some other things. I started researching the health of people in Finland because if I'm looking at the quality of an education system, I wanna see what type of livelihoods are these students going on to live? Are they living independent livelihoods? Are they free from the state? Do they have personal fulfillment, contentment? What are their social relationships like with themselves, with their partners? That word, I don't like that word, you know, with their spouse, with their children and the world around them. So I find it interesting as well that we have alcohol consumption on the rise. So the total al annual alcohol consumption has risen from 7.6 liters in 1985 to 10 liters of alcohol per capita in 2010. So alcoholism is becoming a bigger problem. Why is that? We have obesity on the rise. And now this isn't to just single out Finland. This is an issue in most countries, but I'm showing that this is developing in Finland, which is a very new country. It's only been around for about a hundred years. And then suicide mortality. So Finland has generally been one of the highest in Europe, ranked number 51 by the WHO. Not that I like quoting the WHO, but I mean, in this case, sure. Uh, the very last thing that I wanna read, which I thought was so interesting is this. So check this out. A gradually expanding welfare system can manage an ever greater portion of the family's traditional tasks, and it made couples less dependent on the institution of marriage. Government provisions for parental leave, child allowances, child care programs, and much improved health and pension plans meant that the family was no longer essential for the care of children and aged relatives. So in Finland, the government has replaced the father as the authority. So there is no need for marriage anymore because women don't have to rely on their husbands to take care of them because the government will take care of them. And children don't have to rely on learning from mother and father because the government will teach them. And so the government is shaping up children how they want them to be. And it seems like this utopia because all these studies push out, oh, Finland's the happiest country in the world and Switzerland too. I don't believe it and I don't buy it. 
what is happiness determined off of? And what is the best education system determined off of? Sure, these kids like learning, but what are they learning about? They're still being indoctrinated. And just because you can score well on tests like the PISA test does not mean that you are an educated individual. So this is something that Ty Lopez has talked about and also the historians Will and Ariel Durant. And I think their compilation, one of their lessons of history book they, they, they talked about something that is really important. I think it's where Ty got his philosophy from. There are four things that make up a good life, and that is health, so your physical, your mental health, your longevity, wealth, as in security. So, you know, money is important because if you're constantly stressing about money, you can't be happy, you can't have peace of mind. And that has to do with having your own wealth. So this is something that men, men need to pursue. And love, this has to do with all things social and intimate. So having a family, you know, being with a loving spouse, having a lot of children, that's important, especially for women. That's the point of a strong family, but also being in a community. So this is about you know, having a good relationship with yourself, with your family and your community. And communities are very different from networks. Most of the modern world is a network. If you wanna know what a community is, study something like the Amish or even your own family, because in a, a school, we're going to, we forget most of the people we go to school with. We even forget our teachers, but we never forget our childhood best friend or our grandmother. And the last pillar of, of a good life is happiness. And that has to do with personal fulfillment. And I think that happiness comes as a result of the other three, health, wealth, and love done right. So now let's reanalyze the Finnish people. Do they have health? Obesity is on the rise and the suicide rate is super high. So no, and this is just on an average, not saying there's not happy people in Finland. Of course there are, but just an overall consensus. Okay. Wealth. Well, women don't have the luxury of being feminine anymore and being homemakers and housewives and staying at home with their children. They've now entered the workforce as partners. So in that sense, their feminine wealth has taken away. And also the men don't really have wealth either because they rely on the government. The government pays for their healthcare. The government funds everything for the most part. So Independent wealth, independent land and property, and independent families aren't a thing anymore. And then love, marriages are declining, divorce rates are going up, family sizes are dropping, fertility rates are decreasing. So they don't have that. So how could they ever be happy? How could that education system work? Now, are there things to learn from it? Sure. I, I can see that as I'm teaching my children, to not throw so much at them in one day. The one-on-one -on -one intimate relationship is important. The concept of no tests, no homework and all that, very, very important. But what's even more important is that the children learning with their parents and restoring families, any system of education, which is just a system of schooling because schooling and education are so distinct, that takes a child away from the family and breaks that up will always be destructive. This idea of socialism in Finland is just like Brave New World in a classless society where all people are equal. I feel like they're trying to create some kind of utopian world where they don't know any struggle, but sometimes you have to struggle. Sometimes you have to struggle to get to the place you wanna be because how can you ever know what joy feels like if you've never felt sorrow? How can you ever create something that you call good if you never experience something that to you is bad so we need it it's part of the paradox of life and if you take that away in some kind of socialist or communist country then in lifestyle then you take away what it means to be human and, and that's not okay and this school system is not perfect <laughs> it's not going to last the only thing that will ever last is when we restore education as an intimate experience that is organized by the family as the foundation it's the only way that it's ever going to work. As it's shown us before in cities like Dedham, Massachusetts, it shows it in the Amish and many other communities out there. So I hope that you gained kind of a bigger perspective into Finnish education. I haven't seen anybody really talk about the downsides. It's just so much propaganda out there. But now looking at everything, I guess you can really evaluate, is Finland really the best at schooling? <laughs>